My, you must be gluttons for punishment. Okay then, 10 minutes on narrating change. 10 minutes on narrating change. Or should I say, let me tell you a story about change. You see, we can be understood as beings who tell stories. If you think about it, there's so much about our experience, our lives, that we tell our stories. How, tell me the story of you at school. Tell me about your story of how you overcame doing your last assignment. We employ stories as a way of making sense of the world. Of taking disparate facts and events and characters to put them in some kind of order such that we can present them to people in a way that can be easily understood. So they help us understand or overcome the complexity that other types of communication would stumble uh, to try and uh, would struggle to try and contain. They tell us something about characterizations. They tell us something about the nature of how we related to each other and to the the subject of the of the tale. And that's really important because that idea of a, a moral aspect to it is one that will uh, is enormously helpful as you try to. Uh, ensure that uh, uh, to convey what uh, the individual or the collective has done, is doing and should do in the future. So this kind of idea of a temporal line through it is something that, can, uh, that features very strongly when people uh, undertake narration of change processes, because often what they're trying to do is convey what the organisation was, what it is and what it should be uh, going forward. Now, of course, that's not to say that there is only one story to be told of an organisation, whether it's in terms of constructing strategies or, or giving a, a, an idea of where the organisation should go, or indeed ourselves. Stories are fragmentary. They're from events and facts and various other aspects that can be evolve and shift. They can reintegrate, can, can, can emerge and congeal. They can disintegrate and dissipate. I've included a picture here of, in the background of Guy Pearce playing a character in a film called Memento. Memento is a tremendous piece of filmmaking in which you're put in, a, in the same situation as the main character Guy Pearce plays. And it, it doesn't go from uh, beginning to end in a single way. It goes from end to beginning in little aspects and little snippets. So the main character that Guy Pearce plays has lost his short-term memory. He can't remember, he can't make new memories. So when he comes to, when he wakes up, he looks at people and goes, I don't know who that is. He looks at the car outside and goes, is that my car? He looks around the room and says, why am I in this room? He can't position himself in the social world and that's what narrative does. So how he overcomes that one is he can remember certain things that he wants to get the man who killed his wife, which is why he's got this condition. And to do so, he records facts on his body, but they're only facts. And when he wakes up, he interprets it, he reads and he puts it together. So he reads, find the man and kill him, which is written across his chest. Then John G's up on his shoulder and that tells him it's John G killed him. But of course, what's happened there is he's, he's put these on his body. And latterly, what happens is, ah, the punchline. So spoiler alert, he lies to himself to create a narrative that he then enacts. And that's really important because it, knowing that this that narratives can be evolved and changed like that, it shifts our attention away from thinking about the story overall to think about what are the aspects of the film, of those stories? What are the little stories that come before the main one? So I can tell you the story of Memento, but each of those little segments in there the, of the film had to be put together. So Boji looks, David Boji looks at these anti-narratives. Now anti just says before narratives. He's looking at things that come before and therefore contest what's the nature of on the picture. Right. So this is his diagram. Of course, it's full of language. It, it does confuse people terribly. But we'd seen great example of this. When we looked at uh, the British uh, cycling case, and there was a video that uh, we watched of the chief executive speaking to the performance coach. 
Now, if you go back and watch that again and think, what are their anti and their little narratives? How are they trying to support the vision and strategy that they put forward that they've been pursuing? So what you'll find is there was a lot of discussion. They had to, at some level, deal with what Boji calls the beneath stories. Clearly, there were rogues in the, in in amongst what the the situation as they arrived in it, and there had at some stage to be a purge. There had to be there had been uh, an inquiry which had or, which had uh, found various pieces of corrupt corruption and poor practice within the uh, within British cycling. So they have to deal with this kind of scandalous past, these these bad people. And what they say is, well, we've heard lots of noise. So they deal with that by, some, by, by pressing it into the background. And what they emphasise is to say, we, we were trying to make sure that we were delivering on the great work that, we, that had gone before and the fantastic uh, aims of, the, of British cycling. So they, they employed what they call before for having anti-narratives, that we are here to achieve something which is of a greater and social good. When you listen specifically to the, the performance coach, then there was a lot of stuff he was trying to do of foretelling. So he was over in this cyclic bet side of it, on the other side of the diagram. And what he was trying to say there is to say, well, look, I have uh, been working with these coaches before, so I heard all of this noise and it just wasn't representative of what I understood because there was a really good team in there. We had fantastic results in the, um, uh, in the worlds at the track champions. And actually what we've done is to make sure that uh, that we open up a space where that can be repeated. So if you look at Bergen World Championships in 2017, we did blah, 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 blah. So what he's doing is retelling or, or showing that what's happened in the past is something that is now cyclically repeating. So, so he's bolstering the idea we are de de delivering our strategy through foretelling, through, through showing the repeat of history on, into the future. And it's interesting as well the way that he speaks about that, that achievement. This isn't great chest-thumping um, charismatic leadership that he's engaged in. It's what I would call betweenness. It's about the relationship that he has, the, that he's seen with his coaching team, with the, with the athletes within there. And indeed, the chief executive does the similar type of thing, but this time in terms of uh, the um, uh, participation element, when she starts talking about the great work and it was wonderful when I see people out in bikes and realise we've done that. Although, as I said, whether they've done that or this is a general, a, a, gen, a wider trend and a reflection of heavier rail flares and bus flares, that is an open question. The thing is that, of course, what she's doing is she's mobilising particular aspects of facts to be to create stories to support the way in which the interpretation of reality that uh, that they want in order to perpetuate their idea of strategy within uh, within British cycling, and that's really important to 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 catch on to here. That just like when we looked at um, communication and communication, you have to pay attention to what is said and what is uh, what is unsaid because people will cotton on to that stuff. Then in this in in this aspect, change, constructing a change narrative by elevating some facts over others is perfectly okay and is what people do but you do have to have an idea of what is happening beneath and have a way of dealing that whether whether to show that those beneath stories are exceptions or those beneath stories are ones that are being dealt with or that they are representative of, a, of a, an older way of working that has been cleared out now they have to be dealt with in order to keep, maintain the cleanness of the, the particular picture and narrative that's being perpetuated by the organisation. So what's really important in there, I guess, is to say, remember that it's not what is real for somebody. There's no point in trying to argue that your story is better than other people's. They are all stories. What is important is what is taken as real. So communication is definitely more than just a telling of a, of a story. It's more than simply delivering a, a message. It's about trying to make sure that people have a, a, have a relationship with the individual who is making that story happen and they are, they are involved in the dialogue such that they are a part of the story and are ready, and ready to change and accept what's going on. 
The will in that aspect, therefore, always, always, always be dynamics of interpretation. There'll be dynamics of interpretation which are, are um, pressing towards the, 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 the perpetuation of a particular narrative, and there'll be those that are pressing against uh, against that one, undermining that one. And uh, again, there, there, there's a key point in here of understanding that this is a representation of changes, things happening, which comes between that discursive realm and the material realm, but always in the way of a, an ongoing process of reinterpreting is this change something that is worthy, is is moving at a suitable pace and is achieving suitable aims.